The facts of insecurity. That I am insecure is a fact, and that I seek securities is also a fact. That which I consider secure is not secure, because it also is finite. This too is a fact. You may think that by, by giving away whatever securities you have, you will become secure. One man did this. He gave away his house, his business, and his bank balance, and went to a swami. But the swami was also insecure and wanted to have a following of disciples. Previously, the man was on a husband trip, a father trip, a business money trip, and now he is on another trip, a swami atma trip, minus a house, wife, children, money, and so on. To think that subtraction is going to help when addition does not is nothing but a lack of understanding. And if artha is like this, karma is the same. No pleasure is going to be lasting. Take music for instance. You buy a recording of a hit song. Why is this song a hit? Because, like a hit man, it knocks all of the other songs out of the running. Last month's hit song has been hit and is no longer a hit song. It only gathers dust on your tape deck. Unwanted, no one bothers about it anymore. Similarly, your attitude is always changing. What made you happy before no longer provides the same joy. You get tired of everything. Even if God were around you all the time, you would eventually want some privacy. This constant changing is natural because you are basically displeased with yourself. Therefore, you are pleased only now and then. The only silver lining in life is one's hope. This is all that keeps you going. Perhaps hope is nature's way of enabling you to survive so that you can discover nature herself. Suppose these moments of pleasure, which are so few and far between, were denied to a given person. Suppose they were not there at all. Do you think a self-conscious human being, the displeased human being, would want to live? He or she would surely commit suicide. And in spite of these moments of pleasure, if a person thinks there is no possibility of being happy, either because of a loss of some kind or an apprehension of some great calamity, the person would choose not to live. This is the thinking behind all suicides. Therefore, moments of pleasure are worthwhile because they keep you going. The hope is that you will discover that you do not need a mother-in-law to be displeased. You need only yourself. If you close the doors, put aside the world and sit in an easy chair, you will understand whether you are pleased with yourself or not. You will find that you do not require a world of perception, a world of books or whatever to be displeased. All that you require is yourself. After just a few minutes of sitting with yourself, you want to get up and go out or take a shower, anything. The world is not the cause of your problem. To be displeased then requires nothing but yourself. It is not the world that displeases you. You are displeased with yourself. And whatever pleases you is going to be time bound. All of which we will see as we study the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. Because any karma any desire you pick up is limited by nature in terms of time, content, and degree. The one who is displeased remains in spite of occasional moments of pleasure. Therefore, we have now discerned the problem to be, I am displeased. A fact that is not going to be altered just because 
I pick up moments of pleasure. That I am insecure does not change merely because I acquire or give up certain securities. Thus, the only solution is to see myself secure and pleased with myself. But how is it possible to do this? If with all these securities and pleasures I am displeased with myself, how am I going to see myself pleased without them? This is where the teaching called Vedanta comes in and tells you that your problem is not one of lacking something, but of not knowing that you do not lack anything. It converts all one's pursuits into a pursuit of knowledge. In the vision of Vedanta, there is no reason for you to be displeased with yourself because you are totally acceptable to yourself, not by attitude, but by fact. It is not a belief. It is a fact, a discoverable fact. Only something that can be discovered is a fact, and the discover discoverable fact here is that you lack nothing. You are totally free. That is a vision of you and is the heart of Vedanta, the heart of this teaching. The problem of what I lack is thereby converted into ignorance that I lack, the cause of which I do not know for the time being. Until I come to know the vision assumes the status of a promise. You are the problem. You are the solution. Vedanta defines the problem as not what you lack, but that you lack, and says that you are the solution because you are the problem. There are two types of problems. One has its solution outside the problem and the other has its solution within the very problem itself. The solution to the problem of feeling cold, for example, is outside the problem in the sense that you have to either cover yourself, go to the fireside or go out into the sun. You may even decide to go to the Bahamas. When the solution to a problem is outside, it means that you have to do something to solve the problem. If hunger is your problem, you have to feed the hunger by eating food, which is also outside. The solution to a jigsaw puzzle, however, is within the problem, within the puzzle itself. Because the solution is within the problem, there is no problem in fact. The only problem is you, and the solution is also you. When you do not understand something, it is a problem for you. Whereas, if you understand, there is no problem. The understanding is the solution. In the vision of Vedanta, you have no problem in fact. Then, you may ask, how can I recognize that I do not have a problem? This seems to be one more problem to add to the ones I already have. But is it? One problem is not there. The problem of self-non-acceptance. Because in the vision of Vedanta, the self is acceptable. What else do you want really? The only problem any human being has is self-non-acceptance. Therefore, you are the problem and you are the solution. Now, your pursuit becomes one of knowing yourself and it can be a game, fun, all the way. This then is the teaching. A discriminative analysis of dharma, artha and karma leads one to a certain fundamental human problem. Once this human problem has been discerned, you will take special steps to resolve it, you may, even though you may continue to pursue artha, karma 
and dharma. The solution to this original fundamental problem is called moksha. Moksha is not salvation. Moksha, as we have said, is not an equivalent to salvation as it commonly thought. Nor is it some kind of accomplishment other than yourself. As freedom from something, however, moksha could be considered a negative accomplishment of sorts. Nevertheless, there is nothing more positive than moksha. Once we say freedom, the question is, freedom from what? And the answer is simply, freedom from something I do not know. No one wants freedom from what he or she wants. Therefore, no one wants freedom from artha or karma, securities and pleasures. We want artha, karma, a little bit of dharma plus moksha. Moksha is not freedom from artha or karma. That which artha provides, moksha cannot provide. But that which moksha provides be, cannot be provided by artha, karma and dharma combined. A person who has moksha also has the freedom to pursue the other three human ends, artha, karma and dharma, if he or she so chooses. This, then, is real freedom and not freedom from these pursuits. And who is that undertakes these pursuits? The person called Purusha in Sanskrit, meaning any person, young or old, man or woman, Indian or American. This Purusha the person is the one who is after artha and karma. All actions have a purpose. A human being never undertakes a deliberate activity without it having a purpose. Even involuntary actions have a purpose. But here we are talking only about those actions that are voluntary. Voluntary deliberate actions always presuppose a desirer whose desire is never for the action as such but for the result, the object of desire. There is always some end in view. An object that you have cannot become an object of desire if you know you have it. However, you may have something and not recognize that you have it and therefore be after something you already have. Thus the clause, if you know you have it, is important here. For instance, you cannot desire a head over your shoulders since you already have one. Even if you have such a desire, no one can fulfill it, not even the Lord. If you were to ask him why, in spite of all of your devotion and prayers, he has not fulfilled your desire. He could only say, I cannot give you what you already have. When I tell you that I cannot give you something, there are only two possible reasons for my response. One is that I am incapable of giving it to you due to my lack of knowledge, power or resources. The other possibility is that I can give it to you, but you do not deserve it. You are not qualified to receive it. Therefore, either you are not qualified to receive it or I am not qualified to give it to you. Here, however, the incapacity to give a head over your shoulders is because you are asking for something you already have. How then can even God give you one? If you want one more head, being God, he can give you a second head Although I do not know how a second head is going to help you if the one you already have has not, but he can give it to you. You will have to tell him, of course, where you would like it put, but do not ask him to give you a head over your shoulders. What you have, he cannot give you. Although you cannot desire an object that you know you have, 
You can always desire an object that you do not have. There are many things that you do not have, like a green card, a new house, another job, a promotion, wife, husband or children, a trip to a particular place, anything you do not have, you can desire. Thus, what you do not have can become an object of your desire. Without a purpose, there is no effort, no deliberate activity. Therefore, the Purusha, the person, undertakes activities for accomplishing different ends, mainly Artha and Kama, but also Dharma. If this is so, there is a very important question to be asked. Do I want Artha and Kama for the sake of Artha and Kama themselves? The answer to this question is what distinguishes the entire Vedic vision of human life from one's usual way of looking at it. Why do I seek out securities and pleasures? Is karma for its own sake? Is it for the sake of pleasure? Is it just for fun? If so, then with it or without it, you are the same. You go for it just because you go for it. In other words, it is nothing more than a fancy. But is this really the case? Are artha and karma, which we are seeking in life, for their own sakes, or are they for myself? The Veda says that every object of my desire is for my sake alone. We only desire that which we know. No one can desire an object that is unknown to him or her. None of you has a desire for Gagabugan, for instance. An unknown Gagabugan cannot be an object of desire. In fact, there is no such thing as Gagabugan. No amount of coaxing will cause you to get into your car and go to Gagabugan. You always have a reason for getting into your car. Some desire is always being fulfilled. Thus, an unknown object does not become an object of desire. Only known objects become objects of desires. There are of course some known objects for which I do not have a desire. Scorpions and cancer, for example. In fact, the more I know of such objects, the more I want to be rid of them. Also, an object that has been known and loved by me need not always be desirable to me. I may have no desire for it whatsoever a few years down the line. No one performs an action or undertakes a course of action without an end in view. Whether the end is right or not can only be discovered later. One may change one's view or give it up altogether for a variety of reasons. We have all done this. But what is desirable now, I will definitely seek out. Therefore, one who desires a particular end, any artha or karma, does so for his or her own sake. Suppose you say, no, Swamiji, it is not for my sake, it is for my son's sake. This only means that your me has become a little extended, but it always reduces to me. Your me can extend to the community in which you live, to your religion, and to your nation also. It is your ego, an extended ego, and the more extensions, the healthier the ego. Still, the end is always for your sake alone. Prayer is always for one's own sake. Even if you offer a prayer, for whose sake is the prayer? For God's sake? Is God in such difficulty that you have to pray for Him also? If God requires our prayers in order to survive, 
then to whom should I pray? If you are praying to God for God's sake, then for God's sake please give it up. For God's sake is only an expression. You do not need anything for God's sake. It is also often said that one should serve God. Is it that God has too much work to do and needs our help? Of course not. Your service and your prayer is for your sake alone and there is nothing wrong with that. If you pray for your mother, father, children, humanity and all living beings, you do so because you can only be happy if others are happy. How can you be happy if everyone else is unhappy? We see this in games for instance. In tennis, you always start with love, like marriage, and then fight to the bitter end. One person wins and the other loses. The one who wins throws his or her racket into the air and says, Wonderful, I won. Whereas the one who loses never throws his or her racket into the air, although it may be thrown to the ground in a gesture of defeat. And when the winner approaches the net, still ecstatic and gasping for breath, to shake hands with the loser, the elation subsides somewhat because every human heart knows what it is to be on the other side. Thus, when others are unhappy, you cannot be happy. Desiring arthas and karmas, then I make certain efforts and if these efforts do not seem to be enough, I make another effort called prayer. Prayer is neither an artha or a karma, it is dharma. Through prayer, you want to gain some invisible result which will give you artha and karma. Although spiritual seekers do not pray for artha and karma, they do pray for knowledge and for maturity, which again is for one's own sake alone. This aspect of the human personality is very important and is basic to the vision of the Veda. When you know that whatever you do is for your own sake, everything becomes meaningful. You find that what you do has its place and everything falls into place. Nothing is more efficacious than anything else. No one action is more important than another. Each action becomes important in its own sphere and is meant for producing its own result. Can we say the ears are better than the eyes or that the eyes are better than the ears? No, we require both. If I see you shouting at me but cannot hear what you are shouting, I cannot respond to you properly. Eyes have their own sphere, so do the ears. Similarly, each organ, the kidney, liver, heart, lung and so on, has its own sphere, each one as important as any of the others. But in order for everything to fall into its own place, the starting point must be proper. Here, the proper starting point is knowing that any action I perform is always for a given end and that end is for my sake alone. The Veda takes the statement one step further to cover certain important relationships. A wife is dear to her husband, not for her sake, but for his sake. Similarly, the husband becomes dear to his wife for her sake, not for his sake. If I understand that everything I do is for my own sake alone, then even my relationships will be very objective. I'll not go about saying, I did so much for you, the starting point for all kinds of trouble. Freedom from being a wanting person. That I want artha and karma reveals that I am an insecure and unhappy person from two different standpoints. What do I really want? Do I want the actual artha and karma, the objects themselves, or do I want security and happiness? Because I want security and happiness, all arthas and karmas are reduced to security and happiness alone. If I am insecure, I naturally seek security, and if I am unhappy, I seek happiness. However, 
It is not the security itself that I want. What I really want is freedom from insecurity. In terms of security, I am wanting, and in terms of fullness, happiness, I am also wanting. Therefore, I want freedom from being a wanting person, and in order to be free from being a wanting person, I have to see myself as secure. I have to see myself as one who does not lack, and I can only see myself in this way when I have no sense of lack. If I am insecure and unhappy, and I see myself as secure and happy because of some kind of self-hypnotism, for instance, then I am under yet another delusion. It is better to be insecure than to be deluded in the thinking I am secure. If I know I am insecure, then at least I can be objective and thereby understand my problems. Thus, one has to be secure in order to see oneself as secure. To be able to say I am happy, one has to be the happiness we talk about. I can therefore see myself as secure and happy either by becoming so or by already being so. I'm using two different words here, becoming and being for a reason. We generally see ourselves as insecure and unhappy and then try to become secure and happy. The whole process of living, the struggles in our lives are all a process of becoming, being insecure, we seek to become secure. People are all after the same thing, really speaking. One may seek this and another that, but over the shoulders of seemingly different ends, we see that two are common, being secure and being happy. My hope is that one day I will become secure, that one day I will become happy. Therefore, even when we are seeking artha and karma, we are all seeking freedom from being insecure and unhappy. This must be clearly understood. Given that everyone wants freedom from being a wanting person, everyone wants moksha. Put it this way, it looks as though moksha is just another end. In fact, it is not another end, it is the end. The end behind all ends. We refer to moksha as another end, another purushartha, only because people do not recognize it as the only end, even though they seek freedom from insecurity. Recognizing this end is the culmination of one's life of insecurities and unhappiness called samsara. The culmination of one's life is not aging, it is the ability to discern yourself as one who is secure and happy. This discerning is part of growing up. Once the fact that you are secure and happy has been discerned, even though you may continue in your various artha and karma pursuits, you have taken the necessary step for moksha. However small the step, the step has been made. Having stepped into this teaching, the necessary step has been taken. You should not be alarmed by the word moksha. You need not worry about what will happen to your family if you study and become enlightened. Believe me, your family will be happy because they will no longer have to deal with your insecurities and unhappiness. Also, by trying to gain enlightenment, the pressure you are feeling will definitely be less because you now have something better to accomplish in life. Otherwise, life is a problem. Marriage, for example, cannot be an end in itself. If it is, there will be problems and the marriage will end. 
Marriage is a means, not an end, whereby husband and wife each seek freedom from insecurity. Freedom from insecurity is their common end and they help each other. Together, as companions, they make the journey. This most significant aspect of marriage is acknowledged in the seven steps of a Hindu marriage ceremony. Only when these seven steps have been taken has the marriage taken place. Each of the seven steps represent one aspect of the couple's journey for which there is a destination, moksha.